from street corner, wagon bed, and opera house stage, they ballyhooed for tonics laced with life-saving ingredients from nature's pharmacy. On courthouse squares, they preached the healing power of liniments fortified with oil from the rattlesnake, Gila monster, skunk, and bear. Under canvas, they testified for tooth powders, worm killers, electric belts, and liver pads. These were the pitch men and women of the American Medicine Show. Costumed as Quakers, Indian scouts, silk-hatted professors, and figures of far eastern mystery. They were colorful, imaginative individuals who took advantage of the vast stage for self-invention, availing all in the twilight years of the American frontier. They had names like Yellowstone Kit, Diamond Dick, Nevada Ned, Wild Harry, Princess Ninita, Dakota Jack, Rolling Thunder, Oregon Charlie, Kansas Charlie, Texas Charlie, and Dr. Blue Mountain Joe. Their personages were spectacles of hair, hats, buckskin, jewels, and glittering raiment of all manner and description. The medicines they sold bespoke a showiness all their own. Wizard oil, Kickapoo worm killer, Kiowa pile salve, Warm Springs consumption cure. As for the rest of the show, medicine showman Nevada Ned, who had never been within a thousand miles of Nevada, noted in a 1929 Saturday Evening Post memoir that the troops presented full evenings of drama, vaudeville, musical comedy, Wild West shows, minstrels, magic, burlesque, dog and pony circuses, not to mention Punch and Judy, pantomime, movies, menageries, bands, parades, and pie-eating contests. Add to that list the occasional ladies' nail-driving contest and the gentlemen's longest feet competition, and you can begin to imagine the Main Street exoticism of the showbiz niche that flourished from the end of the Civil War to the television age. Nevada Ned's memoir also spoke to the flamboyant fashion sense of many medicine showmen. I added $10 gold pieces as buttons on my velvet and corduroy jackets, he wrote of an 1886 performance outfit, and $5 gold coins as buttons on my fancy vests, $3 gold pieces as cufflinks. Around my neck I wore a chain of half eagles, meeting in a $50 gold slug. To relieve this Quakerish simplicity, I wore $3,000 worth of real diamonds and two gold-mounted 44s. My moustache was long and prettily waxed to points, my clothes foppish in the extreme. He added that the crowd who followed him as he strolled through New York City in the get-up could not decide whether to hoot or cheer. I'm currently working on a new heavily illustrated book about medicine shows, and before we track down the Diamond King, I thought we'd take a quick spin through a small selection of the images that I have gathered, then they will set the stage for this intriguing niche of American healing showbiz history. Here's Nevada Ned on the right there uh, when he was a pitch man with the Kickapoo Indian Medicine Company, one of the biggest patent medicine companies. One of the many Kickapoo outfits on the road. None of these Native Americans, however, were actually Kickapoos. 
Some kick a, here's some Kickapoo kick products like blood and stomach renovator, cough cure, worm killer, Indian oil, and Kickapoo salve. Another Kickapoo company here, life on the road with a med show could be romantic, wild, and free, but it could also be gritty and tough. Now, another of the major outfits was the Oregon Indian Medicine Company, headquartered in Pennsylvania. Another Oregon unit on the road somewhere in the late 19th century. And another Oregon Indian Medicine Company troop camped outside some small community along the blue highways of the USA. Hamlin's Wizard Oil was another major company. Wizard Oil Concerns featured a chorus of sharp-dressed gentlemen, and their advertising often included elephants. Med shows often featured trick shooting, like this troupe of healing entertainers led by Kansas Charlie on the far right. The Umatia Indian Medicine Company on the road here. Among the Indians, pitch men, and med show doctors, note the contortionist there. You can see him on a table. Uh, that was an important feature of the vaudeville bill of these shows. Now, the Los Angeles Times noted in 1924 that medicine shows often displayed Gila monsters, both living and stuffed. Now, this beautiful specimen was part of a show that toured small Illinois towns in the 1890s. Rattlesnakes were often commonly displayed, especially when a med show sold rattlesnake oil. Here we see young snake charmer Princess Natella performing with a show led by her father, Doc Marcel, the nature man of the West. Many famous musicians and movie stars got their first professional experience with a med show. One of these was Gene Autry, whose early films often included medicine show scenes. And just as Buffalo Bill's Wild West was wildly popular in Europe, one English pharmaceutical corporation replicated America's Wild West med show throughout the United Kingdom. Nevada Ned first encountered the subject of this talk, the medicine showman Dr. J. I. Lighthall, also known as the Diamond King, on the road in Tennessee in 1881. There was personality plus in the eagle eye and handsome profile of Lighthall, Nevada Ned wrote in the Saturday Evening Post. All our kind were prima donnas, and Lighthall most of all. Now, as far as I've been able to ascertain, Doc Lighthall, also known as the great Indian medicine man of Peoria, Illinois, first came to Texas in the fall of 1885. Uh, his troop had an especially successful stand in Denison, up here on, on the Oklahoma border. His Indian medicine show camped near the Alamo in December of that year, and by the end of the following January, just days after his 30th birthday, he was dead. He reportedly succumbed to smallpox contracted from the San Antonio crowds at his show on Military Plaza. Now someone in Bayer County or Bandera County area saved one of the Diamond King's calling cards and the Frontier Times Museum in Bandera owns and exhibits the card today. We see it here. And in the 1920s, decades after Lighthall's death, museum founder J. Marvin Hunter wrote in his Frontier Times magazine that many people in San Antonio still remembered how the Diamond King electrified the Alamo City. According to the sketch of his life in his 1882 book, The Indian Household Medicine Guide, James I. Lighthall was born in Tuskegee, also called Indian Town, Illinois, in 1856. 
I have a copy of the 1883 edition of the book here, if anyone would like to see it after the talk. Lighthall wrote that he left home at the age of 11 with a youthful ambition to try his fortune in the West. Reportedly, the boy checked, trekked to Kansas and the Indian Territory, where his one-eighth Wyando heritage helped him form a warm attachment for the Indians. By the time Lighthall was born, according to one source, the Wyando people numbered only six to 700. But the future medicine man claimed to have developed a keen interest in the vegetable kingdom at an early age with a natural gift for botany and the herbal kingdom. Thus, he was especially drawn to the Indian doctors from the fact that they were all the time gathering roots, barks, leaves, and flowers. He apprenticed with the native healers, according to the sketch, and assisted with their gathering of nature's remedies. Lighthall claimed to have spent 13 years gathering knowledge about the Indians' herbal medicine, eventually wandering through Wyoming and other territories. In Minnesota, he wrote, he fell in with a physician named Dr. Neff. Encouraged by Neff, Doc Lighthall went into business, first by selling his Spanish oil or king of pain, blood purifier, dentifrice, and Indian hair tonic. Afterwards, treating all chronic diseases according to the Indian theory, by which he has cured thousands of cases. Though a Dr. Neff did later travel with the Diamond King troop, another version states that Lighthall's medical showbiz career was sparked by an encounter with the old original Indian doctor, Doc McBride, as savvy a man as ever backed a bobtail flush. This is the only image I've found of McBride and his new discovery, improved king of pain or commercial tea. I can't read the small fuzzy print in the advertisement except the part that claims the dead restored. As the Peoria Journal told the story, McBride was then on his last legs. Poker, whiskey, and women had brought him in poverty to the verge of the grave. Lighthall was shrewd enough to see that there was money in Doc McBride's business if he only took care of himself. And as he already had the long hair and cowboy garb and wild western aspect generally, he was pretty well equipped for the enterprise. On June 11th, 1877, he made his debut as a big medicine man in Brownsville, Minnesota. His gross receipts for the first day were 50 cents. In another town on the next day, he made $12, and he made money rapidly ever since. Other sources indicate that he didn't break into the medical entertainment business until 1880 at the age of 24. But the 1877 date for his med show debut is confirmed in an 1885 Lighthall publication, The Remarkable Career of Dr. J.I. Lighthall, King of Diamonds. In time, Doc Lighthall became a wildly popular subject for newspaper reporters, and I've harvested tens of thousands of words about him from vintage newspapers. I won't be saying all of those words tonight. To date, the earliest account of his med show performances that I have found is from April 1879 and describes an appearance in the town of Burlingame, Kansas. Our people have been quite highly entertained for two evenings past with music, lectures, and ventriloquial performances given on the street by a Dr. Lighthall, assisted by his wife and a gentleman. In appearance, the doctor very much resembles Buffalo Bill, being six feet in height with long flowing hair, eagle eyes, and expansive brow. 
I don't, I don't think he looked like Buffalo Bill, but maybe you had to be there. In the following year, 1880, a Litchfield, Minnesota report covered the elopement of a 16-year-old girl with one of the doctor's performers. Gals in small towns often ran off with med show performers, and it always created a scandal. And the paper described the man's vocal abilities as imitating cat yells, mule brain, and other refined sounds. A story in the Hiawatha, Kansas paper the same year was more enthusiastic. The doctor operated the banjo, the scribe reported, his wife the organ, and a champion mimic and facial contortionist, his own mouth. They made good music. The writer concluded that Lighthall was a splendid talker and hoped the troupe would come again. As he became more successful and his Indian Medicine Company grew, the addition of a band, singers, comedians, and a road crew swelled the company to as many as 30 people. Many accounts describe some of the company as being of Native American and Mexican ancestry. In 1882, for instance, when Lighthall played Muscatine, Iowa, the local paper reported that many folks suspected a raid by the James Gang when the long-haired Indians and Mexicans entered town this morning. Relieved that it was just Doc Lighthall, the scribe noted that we are promised some excellent street entertainment during the doctor's stay here. Now, many accounts allude to Doc Lighthall's spellbinding sales talk. The most descriptive notes I've found on his lectures are in an 1884 issue of the Daily Gazette of Fort Wayne, Indiana, a town where Lighthall found great success and spent a lot of time. The doctor plainly tells his audiences, the paper reported, that some of them are complete strangers to water and various other pertinent, if not pleasant, facts. The doctor evidently has studied human nature and has learned that flattery is a poor way of gaining public confidence. Now, it's unclear if Lighthall was the first to do so in a medicine show context, but he also came renowned for pulling teeth for free during his performances. On the road, he told audiences that the garden paths of his palatial Peoria home were paved with human teeth. In the show business paper, The New York Clipper, he challenged other performers to best his record of pulling 14 teeth in 19 seconds without pain. Occasionally, he would ask a patient if the procedure was painful, and when they said it was not, he would roar, what liars these people are. In 1885, the Chattanooga, Tennessee newspaper captured a hilarious scene between Lighthall and a rival tooth puller. This image shows the Diamond King and the crowd at his show. Broad Street, at its intersection with Ninth, presented a most extraordinary appearance yesterday, the paper reported. Dr. Lighthall, an Indian doctor, has taken his stand there and has been giving an extraordinary exhibition of dentistry. Yesterday, a French lady in a similar line of business stationed herself near Lighthall. The two were not 25 feet apart and each had their own band. Doc Lighthall is attired in a suit literally studded with diamonds. The entire display valued at $150,000. The lady is dressed as an Indian princess and she also makes a gorgeous display of diamonds. There is bitter enmity between the two. And yesterday, a crowd of fully 2,500 witnessed the extraordinary scene. The two mounted their stands and began to operate on teeth. They soon began to quarrel and finally concluded to drown each other out. Whenever Lighthall would begin to address the crowd, the French lady's band would start up, and whenever he spoke, she spoke, Lighthall's band would be given the signal. 
They quarreled the entire afternoon. When either would pull teeth, they would pitch the molars toward the other and the crowd would yell. Dr. Lighthall has wonderful skill in extracting teeth, pulled several hundred during the day. A Cincinnati reporter interviewed Doc Lighthall around that time and asked about a pen Lighthall wore that reportedly contained 179 stones, one weighing six carats. The medicine man said the piece had originally been the final order of a St. Louis diamond broker. It is said that he went crazy, observed the doctor, and I guess he did, for no sane man unless he was as eccentric as I am, would order, much less wear, a bauble of that description. The reporter described Lighthall's diamond-encrusted sombrero, his diamond vest buttons, four giant rings of topaz and sapphires, massive gold chain, and other med show bling. Lighthall professes to have been fond of jewels ever since he was a boy, the scribe noted. And naturally, a showman sporting that much sparkle could not continue billing himself as a mere Indian doctor. So in late July 1885, the Decatur, Illinois newspaper announced that Doc Lighthall had upped his game so much that he would henceforth be known on the road by the regal mon moniker of the Diamond King. The company left St. Louis on November 9th of that year, 1885, traveling by train. In Texas, they stopped for a few weeks in the Red River town of Denison, where the Sunday Gazetteer reported that, our people are getting a little delirious over the Diamond King. He is all the rage, and the excitement is not confined to any particular class. He has taken the city by storm. Decades after his visit, a Denison reporter reminisced. It was said that the doctor worshipped invisible spirits and would talk to them the same as in the flesh. And though a Dallas Mercury reporter later wrote that he astonished Big D, the show spent less time in Dallas and Fort Worth, and by December 20th, the troop was camped near the Alamo. An announcement in the San Antonio Daily Express introduced them. Tomorrow afternoon, the Diamond King will pitch 40 tents at the corner of Houston and Nacogdoches streets. The camp will remain several weeks and the public are cordially invited to visit and inspect the greatest Indian medicine company ever organized. Teeth will be extracted by the Diamond King daily, free of charge. On Monday night, he will appear on one of the plazas wearing $300,000 worth of diamonds, the largest collection in the possession of any one individual in the world. The troop paraded down Commerce Street in San Antonio on the way to Military Plaza. And the Diamond King was riding in what Vic Daniels described in the San Antonio Express as a gaudy and highly attractive wagon drawn by a splendid team of four dapple horses dolled up in more gorgeous finery than any circus animals. Doc Lighthall drew a crowd of followers to his wagon by tossing out handfuls of nickels. Other reports say the medicine man showered the crowd with quarters or even silver dollars. From his hand, wrote J. Marvin Hunter, there sprang a glittering stream. In a moment, it tinkled on the pavement. There was an instant of astonished stillness and then the crowd threw itself bodily into a squirming, fighting mass onto the offering of the Diamond King. At the open air bazaar of Military Plaza, the company joined an exotic scene perfectly suited for a medicine show. Barkers, hustlers, and pitchmen hawked jewelry, serapes, and herbs by flickering torchlight. 
Raven-haired chili queens sold spicy eats from portable stoves hauled by ox-drawn carts. The image of the chili queen table shown here is from a German immigration publication, and it appears on the cover of the book Chili Queens, Hay Wagons and Fandangos, The Spanish Plazas in Frontier San Antonio by Louis F. Fisher. On the plaza, strolling troubadours vied for attention with shell game operators and silver-tongued orators. And many San Antonio historians have said the greatest attraction during his brief military plaza stand was Dr. J. I. Lighthall, the King of Diamonds. Vic Daniels, recalling the scene some 45 years after Lighthall's death in San Antonio, wrote that the doctor blazed with what appeared to have been almost a wash tub of diamonds in his hat, on his fingers, in his necktie, his watch chain, decorations upon his coat and vest, and his clothing, velvet, red, I believe, Daniels continued, tailored to perfection, of the old colonial style with all the buttons made with five, 10, and $20 gold pieces. The sports writer Fred Mosbach wrote in the Express News two years after Daniel's report that he recalled the Diamond King wrapped in a sealskin overcoat topped by, with a large sealskin hat sparkling with diamonds arranged in designs of large stars. In addition to what Mosbach recalled, Lighthall's interest-gripping sales talk for his medicines delivered between song hits by members of his company, the sports writer described the tooth-pulling part of the show. Lighthall, with forceps in hand, was busy as a butcher preparing a barbecue dinner for a fireman's picnic, hurling molars and incisors high into the air like shooting stars on a dark night as he extracted these from the capacious jaws of his victims with lightning rapidity. The patients were seated in front of a bass drum pounded with deafening effect while the band played Johnny Get Your Gun so that none in the crowd could hear the patient scream and even the patient forgot about the pain with the drum beats pounding in his ears. Those two reports were reminiscences published in 1931 and 1933, but the Diamond King made the papers constantly during the weeks he performed and sold medicine in San Antonio, wildly flattering. Some of the newspaper reports uh, could have been paid advertisements in disguise, in disguise. A local furniture store even used the medicine man in one of its ads, as you can see here. The Diamond King pulls teeth with imaginative pleasure to his victims. We sell furniture with actual pleasure to our customers. But on January 24th, 1886, just five days after Dr. Lighthall turned 30 years old, the Express News reported, the Diamond King is now down with the smallpox and a yellow flag is flying from his camp yard. A minor epidemic of the disease had broken out in the city, and San Antonians assumed the doctor had been infected on the plaza by one of his patients. Local physicians believed the case was a, was a mild one, but reporters noted that its severity was aggravated by Lighthall's continued drinking of ice water after the, the appearance of pustules. The King of Diamonds, the great Indian medicine man of Peoria, Illinois, died around sunset on January 25th, 1886, in the shadows of the Alamo. Of the many accounts of his short but remarkable life that appeared around the country, one of my favorites was in the Elmira Daily Advertiser in Elmira, New York. The reporter interviewed a local fellow, George Roberts, who had traveled as a member of the Lighthall Troop. 
Two years ago, the story went, the party worked Nashville, Tennessee, there being eight men and two women in the band, among whom was George Roberts of Elmira, a great favorite with the doctor and who assisted him in waiting on customers. From Nashville, the party drifted southward when Lighthall discovered that parties were selling Indian oil, the name of his own medicine. He then changed the name to Spanish Oil and increased his company to 61 persons by taking in several Spaniards, Indians, and Mexicans, and thereafter showed in a 100-foot round tent. Big crowds were attracted everywhere, and money rolled in fast. The company occupied tents, did their own cooking, and lived on the fat of the land, as Roberts expressed it. Lighthall was a great favorite with his assistants, and nothing was wanted by any of them that was not supplied by him. He was charitable, and on many occasions when poor people applied for medicine, the bottle was handed to them wrapped in a $10 or $20 bill. Regrouping, Lighthall's second wife, Victoria, took over the show. Calling herself Mrs. Dr. Lighthall, or the Diamond Queen, she also took up the Tooth Pulling Act. The company toured Texas from the Rio Grande to the Red River before heading to New Mexico Territory. Here we see an advertisement for the troop's appearance in Seguin, Texas. Covering their performance in Sherman, Texas, the Fort Worth Daily Gazette noted, This lady disports all the diamonds and gorgeous jewelry worn by her late husband. She is young and pretty and pulls teeth with a kind of scientific abandon that is amazing. It is said that lots of young men go up to have their teeth pulled out, not because they ache in the least, but simply to feel the magic touch of the fair queen's fingers. In Las Cruces, Mrs. Dr. Lighthall advertised that the celebrated Indian remedies sold by the troop are guaranteed strictly vegetable and sold under a guarantee to give satisfaction if used according to directions. Furthermore, the Diamond Queen announced that $500 will be paid anyone showing that chloroform or opiates of any kind are used in the preparation of her late husband's medicines. So let's talk a minute about the actual medicines. Several sources I've found indicate that most of the medicine was prepared in Peoria by Lighthall's mother and her third husband, Isaac Wright, then shipped in barrels to the traveling show's camp where it was bottled and labeled. And that may have been true at one time. Documents in Lighthall's probate file, however, confirmed that at the time of his demise, his medicines were prepared, mixed, bottled or boxed, and supplied to him by the firm of Allaire Woodward and Company of Peoria, Illinois. That distinction would indicate that Lighthall's remedies were likely just as effective as many other botanical preparations made and sold at the time in the United States. The medications included the liniment Spanish oil, an Indian blood purifier tonic, Indian herbs of life, a consumption cure, worm candy, liver pills, dentifrice, dyspepsia cure, and several others. One of the most recent commentaries on the effectiveness of his medications appears, oddly enough, in a 2003 issue of the International Journal of Pharmaceutical Medicine, published in London. The author, a British pharmacy professor and historian, had gotten a hold of my 1997 book, Mystic Healers and Medicine Shows, which includes a chapter on Lighthall and reprints several of his medical formulas that appeared in his 1882 book, The Indian Household Medicine Guide. The British professor concluded that Lighthall had a reasonable knowledge of 19th century medicine and materia medica, 
analyzing the Diamond King's use of buku, uva ursi, eucalyptus, juniper berries, white oak bark, and other plant components, the professor judged the showman to have been anything but a charlatan. So let's take a quick look at Lighthall's 1882 book. That first edition was co-authored with Dr. W. O. Davis, an 1879 graduate of the Eclectic Medical Institute of Cincinnati. Davis' name appears on the title page, disappears rather, on the title, from the title page in the 1883 edition, and all of the many reprints of the book have utilized the 1883 edition. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, Davis and Lighthall wrote, concluding an essay on anatomy. We are a greater mystery to ourselves than all our surroundings. Still, they maintain with Hippocrates that all men ought to be acquainted with the medical art, and they discourse in common English on physiology, hygiene, digestion, and climate. Introducing a lengthy section on the Indian Materia Medica, which details the physical characteristics and medical applications of nearly 100 plants, the authors explain that medicine never cured anything. It is the natural tendency of a majority of diseases to get well within themselves, free from medical aid. Medicine simply assists nature to remove the cause that obstructs her acting in a normal condition. Many of the remedies in the book can combine two or more herbs. One such preparation called for rattle root, one part, prickly ash bark, two parts, poplar bark, two parts, sarsaparilla root, two parts, dogwood and wild cherry, one part, Fill a quart bottle, one half full of the above, finely cut up, and add whiskey till full. Dose from a teaspoonful to a tablespoonful before meals. This will cure rheumatism, give an appetite, strengthen the nerves, and purify your blood. A section on health care for horses includes a story about one of Lighthall's father's horses. It broke out in the middle of the night and got into the cornfield and ate a hearty meal of green roasting ears. The result was a fearful case of colic. The horse swelled almost to bursting. Father sent for and far and near for men that claimed to understand how to treat horses when sick. They gave soda, hot salt water, pepper, and a great many other things. The general prognosis was that the horse would die. I happened there at the 11th hour and gave the horse four ounces of aloes dissolved in a quart of warm water, adding to it one half pint of good whiskey and a dollar bottle full of the King of Pain or J.I. Lighthall's Spanish oil, all at one dose. The horse soon quit, quit groaning and in eight hours had a free action from the bowels of undigested green corn, and then the horse got up and went to nipping grass and made a good recovery. I pronounce it a sure cure for colic. Opium, wrote the medicine man, should not be used as much as it is, but should be taken only in extreme cases, such as pain from cramps and neuralgia, wounds, mashed and broken bones, and then should be used in very light doses. Mothers do a very foolish act when they give their babies Godfrey's cordial, Bateman's drops, or paragoric. Children have been killed by their improper use. That last sentence haunted the Diamond King's widow a few months after his death when the show played Waxahachie. Her four-year-old daughter developed a cough and she gave the child a dose of remedy and then retired. During the night, reported the Dallas Morning News, the girl stood on a stool to reach the medicine 
drank the entire bottle and lingered about 36 hours before she died from an overdose of morphine. And speaking of haunting, a frequent letter writer who called himself Cherry Bob wrote to the San Antonio Light about encountering the medicine man's spirit in 1886. I passed the old landmark known as the Triangular Square, he wrote, situated on the corner of East Houston and Nacogdoches Streets. As I heard the distant convent bell tolling the hour of midnight, I plainly see rise before me a dark mist which gradually arose until it seemed the height of a full-grown person. Then it wasted away, and I beheld a man standing with his head uncovered and a handkerchief encircling his face. It flashed upon me in a moment that this had been the camping ground of the lamented Diamond King. He raised his hand. Oh, God! One that has ever gazed upon those classic features could never forget them. It was the Diamond King. He made a motion of the hand. The index finger pointed to the ground and then reappeared the mist encircling his form. And then in a twinkling, everything was a blank. Ghost or not, three former members of Lighthall's troop showed up one night in 1899 at the still vacant triangular lot near the Alamo and began digging, hoping to unearth a small chest with $50,000 worth of diamonds that Lighthall had supposedly buried there shortly before he died. As the San Antonio Express noted in his report, the mysterious digging gen generated a high pitch of excitement amongst residents of the neighborhood. I have not located any account of the trio's findings. Now, in, in terms of the history of the West, the Diamond King made an important appearance in a 1948 biography of John W. Bedemillion Gates. Gates, of course, came to San Antonio in the 1870s to try and sell the newfangled barbed wire to Texas cattlemen. Many accounts pegged the year as 1876, but San Antonio area ranchers were skeptical. According to the two authors of Gates' biography, entitled Bet a Million, Gates got the idea to put on a show to prove the utility of barbed wire as he stood at the window of the Hole in the Wall Saloon watching Doc Lighthall perform on Military Plaza. Gates set up a corral in the plaza, ran Longhorns into it, and proved to spectacle ca skeptical cattlemen that the wire fence would hold the cattle. I'm awaiting some documents from a library in Worcester, Man Massachusetts, but it, that may prove or disprove this claim, but it has always seemed to me, and I still believe at present, that the author, authors of this book just made up the Med Show connection. For one thing, Doc Lighthall wasn't known as the Diamond King until the mid 1880s. And for another, I found zero evidence that he was in San Antonio before 1885. San Antonio historian Louis F. Fisher interviewed a, unearthed rather, a 1910 interview uh, with a Gates associate that placed the corral demonstration on Alamo Plaza instead of Military Plaza and placed the event in 1876, a year before the earliest date on which Lighthall is known to have become a healing thespian. But if the story was true, it would crown the Diamond King as the medicine showman who fenced the West. And I'll end tonight with a 1910 reminiscence of a Denison, Texas newspaper reporter. Though he gets Lighthall's name wrong, uh, this again was uh, 25 years after Lighthall was there. 
Uh, but the, so though he, he gets the Lighthall's name wrong, it is still an interesting account of the Diamond King's time in the Red River town. The chief of all the medicine fakers in Denison was the celebrated Dr. Lightfoot. He was the smoothest, smartest operator that ever appeared on our streets. The doctor dressed in picturesque garb. He wore a cowboy hat and his long black hair fell in graceful curls upon his shoulder. Thousands flocked to hear his talk and thousands had their teeth extracted. The people were captivated by him and the town went wild. He had a guardian spirit, and it was said that the doctor worshiped invisible spirits and would talk to them the same as in the flesh. Dr. Lightfoot was a man of commanding presence, and many ladies in Denison thought him so handsome and fascinating that they opened their doors for him. That was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I remember, uh, okay, we had a lady who gave a talk about five years ago on the Spanish influenza, the Spanish flu, although had, Spain had nothing to do with it. Um, <clears throat> in 1918, and she was saying of the 30 products that were available to cure the Spanish flu, 20, this is 1918, not 1886. Of the 30, 29 of them were just as hokey as some of these formulas that some of these folks were selling. One of them kind of came close. So that tells me, even as, the, as late as eight, 1918, they were peddling at the drugstores the same products that these guys were selling. <clears throat> Any comment? Well, you know, even, even in the 1960s, you could buy stuff off the counter that had uh, funny stuff in it. Uh, I mean, I, I remember me and my compadres experimenting with things like that that we would buy from a drugstore that would, you know, make you a little funny. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, uh, there was a law passed in 1906 that was supposed to rein in the patent medicine business, and it did, did so to a great extent, but there continued to be a lot of uh, irregular medicines sold. And, and you have to remember that... Uh, that was a time that even some of the mainstream medicines that were sold in drugstores and uh, prescribed by doctors were not that great uh, in many cases. So it was, it was still kind of the Wild West of medicine in 1918. When did uh, the medicine era, medicine patent medicine era close? Well, TV really knocked it out, but I mean, as the 20th century dragged on, it got to be a little bit less and less of an industry. Uh, but there were still, you know, lots of shows on the road in the 1940s and really? 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, there, it was still a going concern. Uh, I found a lot of articles from the 30s, say, where people were uh, declaring the death of the medicine show industry. And then you would see letters written into the newspaper where people were going, people were, were saying, no, not at all. So-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so is still on the road. And I made such so much money last year traveling here and there. And uh, so it, it was still a, a fairly passionate scene uh, up into the 50s. A little esoterical question. I'm going to come down to the audience. In the 19th century, because of the lack of real, of quote, scientific medicines. There was a big emphasis on the power of positive thinking, getting rid of uh, negative thinking in your life, mind over matter. Right. Um, I mean, we're talking about some serious books written on these subjects. Did this um, try to take, did this movement try to take advantage of 
that movement? I think it did very much. Uh, uh, I feel like the, the shows themselves offered a placebo effect to lots of uh, rural towns and small out of the way places that didn't have much in the way of live entertainment. And one of the, when one of these shows came through, it was a big deal and, and everybody in town would go to it and it would boost up their spirits, which, you know, as you know, kicks in the endorphins and you start feeling a little better. Uh, so, I mean, there were lots of con artists in the medicine show world, but there were, there were still some people who were sincere about it and sold uh, products that were reasonably good. Um, but, the, but the show themselves, I think, and, and just the encounter of something exotic in your humdrum everyday world, you know, that, that's the reason that a lot of young women ran off with some of these characters as they came through town because they were captivated by them. And it was, it was a ticket to a more intriguing world than they felt was available to them living in their small town. Well, one thing I learned tonight was there appeared to be a deity status even after his death, uh, the apparitions and so forth. Yeah, and, and I, I found a number of medicine showmen who also doubled uh, in different forms of, of mental healing, like you're talking about uh, mesmerism or magnetic healing or faith healing. Uh, uh, there weren't that many, but I, but I found that I was surprised to find this, that there were a number of people who, uh, at the same time they were selling these medicines, they were also doing what they called drugless healing. Uh, as, as it's a form of uh, suggestive therapeutics that was real, that was real popular and that was uh, the ha hallmark of the mind over matter movement. Okay, let me br bring the mic down and uh, this is the library, you can say what you want. <laughs> Questions, comments, or protests, all are welcomed. This is, I considered uh, Mr. Fowler the, the Frank Doby, Modi Boatwright, and uh, William A. Owens of our generation. You have a question. Wait a minute, let me bring the mic to you. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much. Very entertaining, very informative. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. You know, when I think of medicine men, I always just picture them in a single wagon. I think it was very enlightening for me to hear you say that they had this huge show going on and everything. Can you <clears throat> maybe have any thoughts on how it got to be that big and how that started? I'm guessing mo more marketing than anything, but I just always picture like a single wagon with a single guy. Yeah, they, they ranged all the way from a... Uh, uh, one wagon shows that traveled just within a, you know, 50 mile radius of where they lived, uh, all the way up, uh, increasing in the number of performers and the number of vehicles they had in their troop, all the way up to uh, companies that ran by train that would fill up a train. And then there was companies with uh, automobiles, you know, with, 10 big automobiles in, in, in the uh, troop that would, that would uh, carry a large number of performers. So it was, it was, uh, it was quite a variety of, of things. Qu qu good question, thank you. Questions? Okay. That gentleman's question, uh, Pert one for me, I think my view of medicine shows is formed by TV <laughs> and cowboy westerns. It sounds like what uh, one of the things that you're saying is that perhaps the, uh, the medicine show was the center of a lot of these uh, entertainment, that entertainment was the goal in a way to get people in. Rather than being the side show, Sometimes the Metis show was the main attraction. Well, yeah, the, the people came to see the uh, the music, the dancing, the the plays that they put on, and the contortionist and the strong men, the strong women, uh, 
and all, all the other kind of, you know, a whole vaudeville uh, encyclopedia of different kinds of live performance. Uh, and the, the medicine lectures and the health lectures were just kind of a side thing that was thrown in there. And uh, sometimes they were enjoyable, sometimes they weren't, that people would just kind of tolerate them. Well, I had family members in small towns, and I just know that in small towns, they do anything for entertainment because <laughs> sure. there wasn't any. But they, they also did play larger towns, too. Uh, it, it wasn't just small places. Well, 2,500 people is a lot of folks back in 1986. Yeah, that, that could be an exaggeration. <laughs> of course, this is Texas. <laughs> Questions, comments, protests. This man's a teacher. He's imbuing our young with good information like this. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I've, I've learned so much. Thank you. Um, the thing that I, I keep thinking of when you were talking is like what, what I teach. I talk about this book called The Jungle by Upton Sinclair in which the meatpacking industry was like exposed, even though that wasn't the intent of the author. And like literally the FDA was born uh, from that book in part. And what I keep thinking that when you were talking about, and I know this is just before the FDA and before that that book, but we're in 2023 and I could walk into a store and I could see all these things that almost have that elixir type of vibe. I mean, just sure. uh, thousands of products at, at, you know, like at market street, just to name one uh, of many. And, and yet there's always the FDA like this, these comments have not been approved by the or not have been, you know, confirmed by the FDA. Do you think that we'll ever get to the point and I know it'd be a, a large investment by the government, but to avoid any type of catastrophe, because like a lot of times medicines, like I don't think opium, for example, was thought to be dangerous until you know it was tried and then they saw the effects. Do you think that we'll ever get to the point where this age of of you know like magic potion type of stuff that like for example that the the person you spotlight today will eventually be more safe in in a future world? I don't think so personally. I mean, there's too much money involved and uh, people are too gullible. Uh, I mean, television advertising for medicines today, is everything they're saying absolutely truthful? And probably not. <laughs> uh, so I, I, think the, I think this is going to be with us as long as human beings are human beings. Uh, I mean, things have gotten a lot better, obviously. Medicines that you buy in the store now are much, much, much better than they ever were. But there's still a lot of wacky stuff being sold. Back here? Yes. Hello. Um, I was born and raised here in, the, in Dallas. And as a kid, like we were 11 or 12 years old, and we would be given free tickets to go to the State Fair of Texas. And my mom always told me, don't you go in any of those, those side shows and this and that and the other. Of course, my sister and I, we always just big-eyed and everything. And it seems to me like they were had medicine men at these state fairs. Uh, I don't know whether they were, you know, to, but they also had uh, freak shows and everything else. It was all mixed in together. So I, could, I, I don't know whether you touched on that or not. I didn't hear anything about that. Did they do this in, at like state fairs? Somewhat. Well, yeah, I think probably, surely there were some medicine shows or performing at state fairs uh, uh, at, at different times, but uh, some medicine shows did have displays that they would put up. Um, uh, often they they would they would have uh, you know biological oddities and specimens in in uh, glass and you know preserved in alcohol uh just like the that uh gila monster the stuffed gila monster that i showed there a little while ago and, and uh oftentimes if if somebody especially if somebody was selling rattlesnake oil they would have a stuffed rattlesnake on on their set or very frequently live rattlesnakes and i, I write in this new book uh, about the the times where a lot of times, sometimes there were cases where medicine men were doing their pitch on the street and they got bit by either their Gila monster or their rattlesnake. And instead of applying their own remedy right away, 
they hightailed it to the nearest hospital to, to get the mainstream medical care of the day to address their bite. But, but yeah, there were, there were all kinds of uh, displays of, of anatomy, you know, uh, charts of anatomy and uh, different scientific things and pseudoscientific things. So yeah, it, was, it wasn't exactly a freak, freak show, but it was... I'll ask the question and then if there's any other questions, we'll have to repeat it for the, but uh, my great grandmother had a vaudeville troupe. She quickly realized, this is in their late teens, early 20s, she quickly realized people wanted exotic entertainment. Uh, and, and that part of the show took over and the cooking subsided. And it became a kind of a, the cooking was, became a minor part of the show. People really want to be ex entertained with exotic, and she went all, and she would carry any, she hired Jack Benny one time, back of course before he was famous, but, and he did his little entertainment with the violin and the, <laughs> the baton would go across the room and then he'd fall over and things like that. That people like that. Yeah. Any comments? Well, yeah, I'm, uh, people wanted to see something that was uncommon in their personal experience. They, they wanted to have an, a night of entertainment or an afternoon of entertainment that presented, some, presented a different world to them, that, that gave them a vision into something beyond what they see every day. Uh, I, th I think that's just a universal human urge to ha have that kind of experience. Excellent question. A answer, excellent answer. Any questions from the audience? He doesn't come here often, so t this is your time. To <laughs> he has been here several times. He has done something a lot of people thought about doing but never did. He and his William Williams documented the musical history of the Trinity River from Fort Worth and Dallas and all the musicians who got their start in the various clubs in Dallas and Fort Worth. And that is a fascinating book. I want to tell you something. Um, any other questions, comments, or protests while the expert's here? <laughs> He's written more books than Carter has pills. <laughs> I told him to bring some. Did you bring any? I, I have a few okay. copies of Metro Music to, to sell if anyone wants one. Well, I want to tell you something. That Metro Music is phenomenal. Any questions? Questions? This is like the auction house. Going, going. <laughs> thank you, Gene Fowler. Well, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it.